the B plus is growing and we want you to be a part of it. So if you have an idea for a podcast or if you want to you know, write reviews for shows, whether that's WWE, New Japan, local shows especially, you know we have a big focus on Aussie Graps here. So if you go out to shows in Melbourne, we specifically need people in New Zealand, Tasmania, and Queensland. If you go out to shows in those areas, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. We would love to work with you. If you have a passion for wrestling and you want to write about anything wrestling, it can be anything. It can be listicles. It can be in-depth articles, opinion pieces, show reviews, whatever you want to do. If it's wrestling, it's fair game. Shoot us a message or send an email to the B plus at unchained.media. That's the B plus at unchained.media. Let us know what you want to do and we'll get back to you and we'll we'll work something out because the B plus is growing and we want to grow the B plus family. Now on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. For one, Andre. You're not good at this. Get out. Let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. You just made the list. Oh, my God. Sorry, no speaking wish. Tell me. Goodbye and good night. Ball two. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> Tell me, yeah. This is the worst town I've ever been in. Ball three. Tomas covers three handle family credenzo. Mamma mia! And now. Unchained.media presents the B. Podcast with your host, Greg Unchained. It's me, Austin. It was me all along, Austin. Number four, on board. I will never retire. I still got 200 more. I got 200 more holes to lift. Good afternoon, everyone. This is your Man of Mystery, Miss Mysterious, here for all the rest, where we cover everything with an asterisk that doesn't fit into our scheduled programming. I am once again filling in for our fearless leader, Greg Unchained, who is off being a cowboy in the vast wasteland known as Red Dead Redemption 2. For those of you guys who haven't caught up with the podcast last week, uh, I am one of the main, one of the newer members of the B Plus staff. Uh, I'm one of your main contributors on the Facebook page. Please follow us and uh, give us a like. It really goes a long way. So I give you all your wrestling news in your nice little Facebook feed there. I cover all the WA side of professional wrestling here in Australia. So all things EPW and uh, all action. I'm shouting those two out specifically because at the time of recording, they have their events on today. Reawakening at 17 looks like it's going to be a really great card. I'm really looking forward to going over that one. And also, for those of you guys who ha- are familiar with the Facebook feed, I am in charge of the Birthday Bonanza News. At the time I'm recording, I might as well give a shout-out since I'm here. Happy 29th birthday to Andrade Cien Almas. We really want him to succeed. <laughs> He's had a really great showing against AJ Styles these past few weeks and uh, Daniel Bryan with Brie Bella. Like He's going to go a long way. Like he's not getting any push at the moment, but he's super talented. When Once the company gets behind him, he will go far. And I'll give a shout out as well. A happy 48th birthday to Miss Dawn Marie. Uh, ECW Valet, WWF slash E Valet. For those of you, I, I'm, I got into wrestling around about 2001, 2002, kind of when she had her story with Al Wilson and Tori Wilson and that whole thing i won't mention it too much but that's where i'm more familiar with her from so happy birthday to those two if you we try and cover as many birthdays as we can unfortunately some people don't have birthdays every day but what i encourage people to do is to send us news about any of your local fighters who happen to have a birthday when we have a quiet day and we like to recognize slash embarrass them so please do that um message me on social media and we go from there uh, 
on Wednesday to do our Kings of the Sports Universe podcast where we cover New Japan Pro Wrestling, its affiliate production, CMML, Ring of Honor, things like that. Friday, we have our Aussie Grats podcast where we usually interview with an Australian wrestler or someone who's contributing to Australian wrestling in a fantastic way. Uh, our last podcast, we had Michelle Hazlick on there. Really great stuff. Uh, and we also had a bonus episode with uh, Kevin Tiet, I believe, uh, going over the prediction for Reawakening 17. One of our bonus episodes, really worth a good, uh, really worth a look for that. And yes, yeah, Saturday we have our view from the WWE universe. But again, today is not that day. Today, everyone, we are looking at all the rest. I'm going to be covering a bit of MLW. I'm going to be covering uh, part one of Ultima Lucha Quattro. I'm going to be covering some WWE news, and I'm going to, of course, cover everything else in the land known as wrestling. Kick things off with MLW episode 28, Fright Night. We have, of course, our Halloween-themed event, and we started things out. Uh, bef- of course, before I start, I will say, because it was Halloween-themed, uh, some of the stars were dressed up, and the announcers, shame on you, Matt Stryker. Shame on you so much for the, the crustacean puns that, that just, uh, not a fan. Uh but yeah, we started from Chicago. Uh, if you watch, if you subscribe to the MLW YouTube channel, you would have seen this already, and it was reported a few days earlier. MLW like to give their some of their vignettes out early just to build a little suspense for their episodes. But uh, from Chicago at one of their media days, Loki and um, Promociones Dorado were in a hallway, uh, and Tom Lawler was walking towards them. It looked like they were going to have like a big confrontation at their media day, but all of a sudden. From behind, Sammy Callahan attacks Tom Lawler with a baseball bat and starts choking him out. All the while, uh, Callahan is just screaming, go to sleep, go to sleep. And Loki's just kneeling down, taunting him with the MLW title, just saying, you want this, you want this. Very kind of set the tone. I did like that. Not going to lie. I don't know if Lawler passed out. I feel like he did. Um, but yeah, just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Tom Lawler, former MMA backgrounds, like they're he's been in the spin in the face because his signature move is the chokehold because he is a fighting guy and of course it means it's all the more powerful because of course it is. We had we started out with Richard Holiday going up against the King of Sleeves, Joey Ryan. This was pretty straightforward. I love Joey Ryan. He's he's entertaining as a face. He is despicable as a heel. There's a reason he's called um, Mr. Sleeves, man. But yeah, if you're familiar with the King of Don style, you you get all the highlights, you know. Joey hasn't been around that much lately, I'm not going to lie. After his middleweight's championship opportunity, like when they crowned the inaugural middleweight champion, yeah, he's kind of just been hanging around. Obviously, he's still getting booked because the crowd love him, which of course they do. But yeah, it doesn't look like he's really doing much. Uh, which is a little bit disheartening, but eventually they might figure out, okay, you've got this really over guy, let's kind of do something with him. Uh, Richard Holiday, really surprised. I don't think I've seen him since Battle Riot, or I feel like he's had a couple of showings before then, or after then, I should say, but it's good to see him again. Pretty solid match, but again, King of Dong Star, Joey Ryan, hits all the spots, and uh, he walks away victorious. We'll see where Holiday goes. I think he's a heel at the moment. As far as I'm aware, he's that playing him as that millionaire stockbroker kind of character, like just rich and kind of like a current version of Hunter Hearst Helmsley kind of thing. But we, of course, we've got the middleweight MLW champion who's kind of got in that similar vein. So I think that's why Holiday's kind of taken a back seat. But again, that's fine. Congratulations to Joey Ryan. We continue with our episode. We cut to Conan. He's talking to Sammy Guevara. He's got one of his uh, AAA Lucha Libre championships on his shoulder. Uh, we'll be covering that later on as well. He's just pepping him up. It's, it's just a little, little cute thing. You can, if you can dream it, you can do it. Pretty much like that. That's a, it's a, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's essentially how he pretty much said it. And Sammy goes off, yeah, I can do whatever I want to do. But then Selena, Loki, and Co. confront Conan, taunt him about uh, about Ray Phoenix and uh, the upcoming MLW tag match between the Lucha Brothers and LA Park and Hio de LA Park. 
and Loki's saying, doesn't matter who Conan throws that in because the ending will always be the same. But Conan's confident. He's got a seek, he's got an ace up his sleeve, and that man is Daga. Uh, that confrontation will happen in the next couple of weeks, I believe. Um, I'm really nervous about this match. I'm not going to lie. The main reason being, uh, I don't feel like it's a spoiler to say because it was on the MLW Facebook page, but Douglas received a very serious ear injury. How he sustained it, it's, again, because we haven't seen it, but it was for the heavyweight championship and Loki ruptured uh, his earlobe. Like, I'm not, it's quite, there was a lot of blood. If you look at the photos and you look at um, Loki and Selena's coverage of it, they just like uh, they make it sound like it was intentional and that they're simply vicious. So it kind of hints at how the match progressed. But again, we have no idea. So I'm tentatively nervous about this. But Loki is having one of the best runs as champion he's had in years. Especially this is his first big championship since all the way back in, I think, 2002, because he is the inaugural Ring of Honor champion. Uh, that's not really advertised as much, but in terms of big guys leading companies, he hasn't really been that in his tenure because he's in over in New Japan, he was the junior heavyweight champion, which, of course, not the heavyweight champion and stuff like that. But it's I'm really happy to see that Loki's kind of gotten to that place where he can leader franchise and he is that guy to beat because he is super talented i'm really looking forward to seeing this guy come over to australia later on in the month we look forward to seeing you professional of course uh we see i mentioned last week we have uh, it did make mention a promo as well rush is coming to mlw uh november 8th in chicago uh really looking forward to seeing him we cut to Jimmy Havoc, uh, of course, being the Fright Night. This is the big spin the wheel, make the deal, hardcore blood match. Uh, there is a whole bunch of stipulations. Jimmy Havoc won a coin toss backstage to decide that he gets to spin the wheel. Uh, Havoc is in the corner, Titantron, like right in the corner of your screen when you're watching it. Havoc gives a little nudge, like a... Uh, and it lands on Spinner's Choice. Now, this was a interesting, like, there were a lot of great stipulations on there, I'm not going to lie. And I was like, Spinner's Choice, oh, this is going to be great. Because I saw stuff like a first blood match, I saw an I quit match. There were some weird stipulation matches, like a dog collar match or a body bag match, which, okay. Again, I have not seen all wrestling like, I've not seen every single wrestling match in history ever. If there's been matches like that before, send them to me on the socials. But honestly, I don't think I've ever seen it before. Uh, but yeah, by all means, feel free to send stuff to me and say, haha, I've never seen that before. So th those different, but okay. And this is one of those things. Uh, Jimmy Havoc, he said nothing's really sticking out to him. So he tells MLW to do Every, to bring everything they got because they're going to do everything on the spin the wheel. Now, that sounds like it's, if you can take it as two ways, sound like, oh, this is going to be like one of those bloodiest matches ever. It's going to be so violent and like vicious. It wasn't. I am really disappointed in the main event. Um, I'll get to it later. I'll cover this periodically as it goes. We had the PCO versus LA Park match, of course, being accompanied by Selena De La Renta. Every time she is on screen, I will happily talk about her. She is, like I said, one of the best heel managers ever. Really looking forward to seeing what she will continue to do with MLW. Now, this PCO match, this was my favorite match, not just of this episode, but in the past couple weeks. Um... This should have been the main event. I'm not going to lie. It went for about 20 minutes, which is different from the usual MLW format. Of course, you have your smaller matches that go for about maybe 10 minutes each. You have a lot of promos and build up for the weeks to come, the months to come, and just a couple of interviews in between. And then you have your big main event, which usually goes for about 20 minutes, half an hour, or if you have your big main event, it goes for a couple of hours, 
and you get a showing from everyone at the in the MLW roster. But yeah, this match went on longer than the main event, surprisingly. And I will say this as well. PCO is 50. LA Park is about 52, I believe. These guys should not be able to go like this, right? In a world where we have the returning Shawn Michaels and Undertaker who are in their 50s and they are not what they used to be. It's really disappointing to see. Um, but yeah, in a world where we have those guys, PCO and LA Park look like they're in the best shape of their life. This was like, these guys are in their 50s. I feel like I'm going to keep repeating this because I think I need to really drive this point home because I love this match. This was a really good showing. It, they were a little slow in parts, but like, I didn't care because they are big dudes. Because naturally, you look at guys who are, are, are other guys who are around about their age bracket. You've got guys like Chris Jericho and uh, Jushin Thunder Liger, which they're more agile, agile competitors, and they are, their bodies are conditioned for the level of aerial offense that they do because they've done it for years. But PCO and LA Park, those guys are heavyweights, right? They're doing swanton dives, they're doing suicide dives, they're doing moonsaults. They are beating the shit out of each other while at the same time jumping off the ring. Very exciting stuff. LA Park won the confrontation where he hit a spear and he won the match. Uh, but so the leading up to it, uh, PCO, he went to do a big swanton onto LA Park while he was on the edge of the ring or on the apron right, right about that area he missed he landed on the edge of the ring very disgusting bump again bloody 50 i love you pco i love you like i like because you got guys like uh, i'll shout out jeff hardy who like they need a break from all the hardcore stuff they need to take a break and take a breather because they're not at that point that they were but like pco like it was an ugly bump but it looked like he could still keep going. I was like, you guys aren't human. <laughs> you guys aren't human. And LA Park, a WCW original LA Park, looks amazing still. But again, yeah, so because uh, PCO missed that spot, then LA Park then jumped up onto the ring and did a big dive onto the outside, dragged him in, they brawled for a little bit more, and then, of course, LA Park hit the spear for the pinfall. Really loved this match. Again, Definitely should have been the main event. I'll get to that in a second. A bit awkward after the match where we have a promo by LA Park. Selena, of course, is translating for him. It went on about a couple minutes longer than it should have. Because obviously, like most of us, no habla espanol. We don't speak Spanish. So Selena's translating. And when you, like, when you say something's in the language and you're trying to translate, it kind of loses something in translation, like the impact of it. But yeah, he started, LA Park started out saying, God bless, God bless professional wrestling, which, okay. I thought, like, Selena builds up LA Park and he heard LA Park as these vicious guys who are just gonna destroy the Lucha Brothers, right? And of course you have, like, L LA Park and his son, like you don't know, you don't see their faces. They are these masked men, a mystery. I, no wonder I like them. <laughs> I digress. Like you have, they have that mystique about them, and then just they start out with God bless professional wrestling, which okay. And then of course, as they've keep going back and forth, like um, LA Park says one thing, and then uh, Selena translates once again. Then we start hearing like, okay, Conan, you're going to regret what you started. Um, the Lucha Brothers have no idea what they signed up for. The crowd, they've, they kind of tuned out after a while, which I don't blame. They started throwing money at LA Park, which, okay. And he said, I'll take your disgusting money, which was a nice little thing there. But yeah, cut out, like, halve that segment. Don't add the God bless thing. Or if you do, do it when they're cut away. I feel like it either went longer than it should have or it got cut for time. I, it's kind of hard to say, but I still loved that match. Now, we cut to Sammy Callahan being interviewed. He's pissed off that he wasn't in control of his fate. He says to Jimmy Havoc, die, Jimmy, die, about four or five times. And 
Of course, uh, we see Stokely Hathaway. I thought that we'd actually see him in person, but uh, there was a little TNZ thing that asked him about him being kidnapped, and he said whoever kidnapped him was a moron because they didn't um, child lock the car, and he just kind of rolled out, and he said the king will be back November 8th. Really looking forward to seeing him return. Like, management, managing is a lost art. It's one of those things that just more people need to do. Like, of course, wrestling will always be the key thing, but in terms of personalities, sometimes managers are just the best. Now, the big Sammy Callahan, Jimmy Havoc, all the stipulations match. This was an okay match. MLW is great at foreplay. Like, that's what MLW is. It's foreplay. It's building up to these great confrontations between all these amazing stars that you know can deliver. These are some of the best guys from Lucha Underground and Impact and, like, just all across the world. These guys are stellar, so you know what they're capable of. And, yeah, Jimmy Havoc and Sammy Callahan, two of the most creative innovators of violence I think I've seen in a long time. Havoc used a staple gun. You cannot watch these two guys staple each other in the balls and say like that it didn't make you squirm. Like you, you just can't. The the stuff that they did. But this match again went for only about ten minutes, which is usually for the other matches. I was annoyed with this so much and I'll tell you all why right now. No one knew what the hell was going on. I'm serious, like, the announcers had no idea how the match was going to go down because they were going to mix everything together. The referee or the announcer, like, the referee in the ring, the ringside announcer, I should say as well, didn't tell us, the fans or the people in attendance or the wrestlers, how the match was going to go down. So we are watching this, and I'm a big, I'm a big storytelling guy as a fan of wrestling. Like, I love the build-up between two wrestlers i love like the history the storytelling like i love a continuous story and it's a weird thing to say like in such a athletic competition as professional wrestling but i am a big story nut and if you can't explain to me how a match is meant to go there's a problem because i was watching this match and just like are they going for the win or are they just beating the crap out of each other? No, I feel at one stage the ref was counting out. Sammy, oh, sorry, Jimmy Havoc kept asking Sammy Callahan if he wanted to quit because apparently it's part I quit match. Uh, said no. There was, again, like paper cut spots, which is disgusting. Um, then we had Jimmy Havoc. Uh, he zipped up. Oh, I keep messing the guy's names up, but Sammy Callahan zipped Jimmy Havoc up in a body bag, which part body bag match, does that mean that he won? Apparently not. Um, Jimmy Havoc did the taker sit up, and it looked like he was going to get out of it, but then Sammy Callahan did the thumbs up, thumbs down, and he went for the pinfall. Again, like, pinfalls are allowed, okay? And he got the win. So Sammy Callahan won this bout. Uh... Yeah, I was so confused, and I hate the fact that I was so confused. I shouldn't have to be focusing on such a thing when these guys are they just sacrificing their bodies in this match. They're doing some really ugly spots. Um, I don't think I would have minded as much if you'd put the, uh, the spin-the-wheel match in the middle and you would have explained to us what happened. Uh, half my problems would have been gone like that. And if we've had the PCO LA Park match as the main event, that would have been amazing. Uh, aside from that, I did enjoy this episode of MLW. Like, I, I think the PCO match kind of saved it for me. St still okay viewing. It's still worth a look at. Again, hourly segments on YouTube and also now on Fight TV. You should actually, I'll give you guys a little bit of a plug now. Um, Fight TV is also free for new subscribers. If you are interested in subscribing to Fight TV, you can use the code ZEZ1041 and you'll get $15 um, off towards your pay-per-view purchase, which will send a few, few of those dollars our way. So send some of that love and uh, 
yeah, it's really great to see that MLW is expanding the way it has. It won't be off YouTube, but if you choose to watch it on Fight TV, you'll get that extra bonus. And again, the promo code with us is ZEZ10, not zero, 041. Now we cut to, uh, of course, yeah, we have episode 29 of MLW. We've got the Heart Foundation going up against Rich Swan, ACH, and Marco Stunt, debuting Marco Stunt. We'll have the debut of the uh, Puma King. We'll have Brody King going up against uh, the innovator of violence, Tommy Dreamer. That one will be a great showing. I am looking forward to that. Now, let's go on to Ultima Lucha Quattro. Season 4, Episode 21, Part 1 of Ultima Lucha Quattro. We had three matches here. We saw the um, Trios Championship being defended. We saw Taya Valkyrie going up against, or Taya Mondo going up against Ricky Mondo. And we saw the Mask versus Mask match. Uh, for those of you who didn't watch last week, I'm a relative newcomer to the land of the Lucha Temple. It was a little bit jarring last week trying to understand the feel of how Lucha goes about things. I think I described it as it's a production rather than a promotion, and it's a it's a TV show about a wrestling show. It's not a wrestling show, which again it totally is. But I was I, I think because I'm watching this big, it's their WrestleMania, and it came out so well. I loved it. I love storytelling. I mentioned you guys before. I love mythology, and we opened with um, Aerostar giving this big. Um, Back, bit of backstory about the ancient Aztec medallions that came into play. Like, I love that story. It's very, it's, you don't see anything like this anywhere else. Lucha Underground definitely has found its kind of niche in the wrestling world. I think it will continue to be a part of the wrestling world for a long, long time. So we kicked off part one of Ultima Lucha Quattro. We had the Reptile Tribe going up against the Rabbit Tribe. And Exolicious, Ivelisse, and Sammy Guevara in a Tornado Three Way Trios Elimination Match for Lucha Underground Trios Championships. This was an awesome showing. The White Rabbit is terrifying to watch, man. Him and Paul London. Like, that is a great. If you want the White, like, picture the White family, but intimidating. I think that's the best way to describe it. Start off really strong. Uh, Killer Cross dropped Snake with a big boot. Of course, you had the White Rabbits. Uh, everyone's going up. White Rabbit is just decimating everybody by himself. He's got the mandible claw. Like he's just throwing people to the mat. And uh, we saw, because again, we've got like nine people in the ring. We saw five super kicks to take him down and kick him out of the ring, which was awesome to see. Like, I've never seen that many all at once. That was pretty cool. Uh, we had the Reptile Tribe fighting against Exolations and Ivelisse. That was the main confrontation for the most part. Bunny hits a springboard Huracarana. Awesome to see. He ducks a clothesline from Dalga, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, Bunny does like a tilt wheel arm drag, and he delivers a springboard somersault plancher. And the fact that he's doing all this is awesome to see. Cross uh, does a Uranagi slam, slam onto the apron. Everyone's kind of landing on the apron, and then everyone's kind of hitting their spots. You had... Uh, Sammy Guevara, Ivelisse, like all hell is breaking loose. Sammy Guevara hits a super Spanish fly. Cross locks in all, like once they're all outside onto the apron and they all come back in. A lot of the action's now outside during this match. It only went for about 10, 12 minutes, but it was an impressive showing from everyone involved. I should say Cross, like Cross, White Rabbits locks in the mandible claw and he throws Guevara into the ring. Guevara's slowly starting to favor his right knee a bit. Uh, that's worth mentioning. And, uh, yeah, he drops Guevara with a big boot. Uh, Guevara rolls London over to score the first pinfall of the match. Like, there was a little bit of, um, miscommunication where London, I think he tripped over El Bunny. Of course, the White Rabbit is brawling on the apron and he looked pissed. It looks like he was going to beat the shit out of Paul London. But, like, Paul London's like, he's like taking his drive, he's worshipping the White Rabbit. It looked like there was going to be that big confrontation, but then out of nowhere, he just starts attacking Sammy Guevara. He forgives London for now. Yeah, really ugly spots uh, with the mandible claw where I don't know how they do. Obviously, it's magic TV, but he's did the mandible claw on Guevara spitting out blood. 
and he needs medical attention, so he is out of the match, even though so Exolicious and Ivelisse two on three going up against the reptile tribe. So even though the white even though the rap, the rabbit tribe sorry, I'm getting these guys mixed up. The the rabbit tribe, the reptile tribe, I will keep it straight. But the fact that the rabbit tribe are been eliminated, they still come out looking strong and now it's just Exolicious and Ivelisse going up against the Reptile Tribe. Uh, they did their best, Ivelisse and Licious. There were a lot of forearms. There was a lot of kicks from everyone. I, there was a really springboard, there was a really awesome springboard stunner spots that uh, Licious did. Really awesome stuff. Um, Snakes drives uh, Licious shoulder um, to the top rope. Ivelisse does a whole flying crossbody block. I think that was really great to see. Like all of these, like I keep mentioning this stuff. A lot of the high flying spots, really awesome to see. But uh, Snake connected with his signature. Get out of here, um, Moon. It was all the momentum. All the the champions. They one after the other. They start hitting Licious, and uh, they lock Daga locks her in the cross arm breaker. Uh, she had a good thirty seconds or so before she had to uh, had to submit. And the Reptile Tribe are still your Lucha Underground Trios champions. Really great way to kick off Lucha Underground. Like, you would think there would be a lot of clutter with nine wrestlers all at once, but they make it work. And it's really awesome to see. Uh, we had Taya Mundo slash Valkyrie going up against Ricky Mundo with Rosa the Doll. For those of you are uh, no relation, uh, I should point that out. If you're again, if you're new to Lucha Underground as I am, and of course Ricky Mundo, he was a member of Johnny Mundo's um, entourage, but he kind of had a bit of a falling out, and then he kind of he's got a doll. He's from the Isle of the Dolls, and he's got this doll named Rosa, Rosa Rosa. Then he tells it's kind of picture Al Snow, but the new age Al Snow, and she's just telling him to do things. Rose is telling him to attack people and to he he ruined the wedding between Taya Valkyrie and Johnny Mundo, and he's jealous of Taya Valkyrie having Johnny's affection. So really, it's uh, all about jealousy. Lot everyone's emotions are raised during this match. Taya comes out. They they really play that she is pissed. And yeah, Taya beats the crap out of Ricky. I wouldn't say this is a squash, but for the most part, Taya is just laying into Ricky Mundo. And it's it's really great to see. She keeps stomping on his chest. That She does a shotgun medi- meteora. She slaps him in the face a lot of the time. Like Mundo brings out a table from under the ring. He's he does get a little bit of momentum. He does like a crossbody block. Oh, sorry, Valkyrie hit a uh, crossbody block on off the announce table. And yeah, I feel like I'm I'm trying to be devil's advocate and trying to give um, Ricky some like, oh well, he tried, but yeah, Taya just beat the shit out of him. Uh, she locked in the STF like she did a curb stomp, then she locked in the STF, which forced Munda to tap out. Really great showing for her. We'll be mentioning her later on the episode as well. After the match, um, she has this big moment where she's just like, you ruined my fucking wedding. Uh, apologies for the F-bomb there, guys. But yeah, and then she choke slams him through a table, which was, like, it was very contrived. Like, it was very TV, but I liked it. It was really good to see. But you know, that match, again, only went for about 10 minutes, like, I mentioned MLW and they have okay matches for the time that they have, but Lucha Underground, 10 minutes, and granted this is their big WrestleMania show, but 10 minutes, they go all out, which was really great to see. And with the third match that we saw here was uh, Killshot versus Son of Havoc, which is a mask versus mask match. These guys were, obviously, this is the main event. It was the one of the best matches I've seen this year. Kill shots drives me into the midsection of Havoc. Havoc kind of clotheslines on the ring apron there. 
they, they, these guys are just brawling essentially like they have hit, son of havoc is doing like, all these really great high flying spots like his signature is a shooting star prayers he did a uh, frog splash I, i'll mention the spot that just made me mark out so hard um he, they son of havoc's just gone to the very tipping point of the lucha temple and he's jumped off uh um kill shot is on a table near the bottom of the ring and he just jumps all the way off does a big kind of frog splash thing onto the table onto kill shot it like the angle i i i'm a big mark for like the way the camera angle was like it made kill shot look way further back than he was and then we kind of cut to like okay he's closer but still he's really high up that spot was like i was like holy shit I, I I think I said holy shit about five or six times when I watched it. It was it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. <laughs> um so that was one of the moments that made me mark out. Like these guys, they hit all their signatures and yet they still kicked out at two. Uh it got to the point, um Kill Shot uh dropped havoc with yeah, he's he's a knee guy. He did his big knee stomp, kind of shades of low key, for the for the two count. Um, he unbuckles the bottom ring, like one of the corners of the ring. He un unbuckles like the bottom uh, ring rope so that he can um, slide in the stretcher. And uh, that's shades of uh, I think they mentioned as well the history of that, uh, like with uh, kill shot being on that stretcher at some point. But yeah, they brought the stretcher into play, and uh, it honestly it took the way Son of Havoc won this match. He actually had to tie Kill Shot so that he couldn't move. But of course, he had a tricep injury early as well, so they really played that saying that he couldn't lift it up and he couldn't unbuckle himself. But the way that Son of Havoc he once again hit the shooting star press kill on Kill Shot. Kill Shot couldn't do anything. He was bound to the stretcher, able to kick, able to get him out of the stretcher. One, two, three. Killshot has to be unmasked, and he is Lieutenant Strickland, right? So I, I mentioned last week like, that it's um, Swerve Shane Strickland is Killshot. He says there as well that he is Lieutenant, right? But yeah, he's Lieutenant Strickland, and he wore that mask because he left his brothers for dead. He apologizes to Dante Fox. Like we were kind of speculating why he was wearing that mask for a bit of for a long time, and it was out of shame. And usually, with mask versus mask matches, the the winner of the match usually takes off the mask of their opponent. Strickland took his own. He took his mask off, and which was really nice that um, uh, Son of Havoc allowed him to do that, and he handed it to him in a show of respect and like. It was a really kind of touching moment. Um, everyone's kind of going, thank you, Strickland. Oh, thank you, um, Killshot, for all the, all the um, moments that you've had with Lucha Underground. I'm really curious to see what he will do for the next season of Lucha Underground. Like, Shane Strickland is just awesome, man. He is one of the best. Like, in, in MLW especially, especially he, there's a reason he was the inaugural heavyweight champion, but he just has that style about him. Like he is more one of those agile guys that plays really well in this type of environment. So yeah, he exits the temple and we are tentatively waiting for part two. This really turned me around on Lucha Underground. I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit umming and ahhing just from the first couple episodes, but seeing how all this came together, this really excited me. So I hope you guys check out Lucia Underground and you will follow me on my journey. Uh, honestly, I do want to hear from as many people as I can. Uh, hit me up on the socials, at Mr. Mysterious on Instagram or at Mr. Mysterious on Twitter. Uh, just tell me. It kind of explains to me the history of Lucha and uh, what you, how you guys found Ultimate Lucha Quattro. I, I, I'll tell you right now, I think all of this stuff looks awesome. And I want to see more. I am really looking forward to the second part. So I think that we've covered MLW. We've covered Lucha Underground. Before we cut to the wacky world of wrestling news, I'm going to give a, I'm going to cut now 
to our fearless leader, Greg Unchained, to talk about our sponsor for this evening. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. 100 episodes. We made it. We made it to 100 episodes. And what better way to celebrate than by sharing Threadbox with all the B-plus players across Australia. Threadbox is a subscription service for men that brings you a personalized shopping and stylist experience for any budget. You get direct email access to a personalized stylist who, who builds out a style profile for you and sends you all the clothes you need. So if you need singlets this month, you're going to get singlets. If you need belts this month, you're going to get belts. You let them know, and they're going to send that out to you. There are multiple packages available, and you always get more worth than you pay for, because Threadbox know all the best brands. CJ and I both got deliveries this month, and uh, amongst our new threads were KSCY, Offends, Cheap Monday, NXP, and more. So... You can, you can check out our unboxing videos on the Facebook page, or if you go to threadbox.com.au, you can check out past packages that they've sent out there. We believe in Threadbox because Threadbox want to help us, you, and men everywhere look better without all the bother of having to shop. In, in as, as low a price as $40, what more can you ask for? You're going to get more value than you pay for. Just for our fans, if you put in the code the B plus fifteen at checkout, you're going to get fifteen percent off your first box. Head to threadbox.com.au and use the code the B plus fifteen to get your box today. And we're back, guys. Now let's cut in. Let's crack into all the wrestling news that's happened for this week. Uh, usually, how we start things here. I was a little bit unsure how to start this because usually we cover our WWE news first and. Of course, the big news on everyone's mouth, big on everyone's lips, is Crown Jewel. Now, I'm. If you guys are silly enough to waste your money on Crown Jewel, you do it. You do what you want. But I will say, like, we have we have been on the bandwagon of hashtag Fuck Saudi Arabia for the coming months now, and I will mention a few things. I'll mention a few things that just really struck me out as really strange with this whole showing in Riyadh. So apparently with the World Cup, the winner is Shane McMahon. Apparently Shane McMahon is, well, of course, with the World Cup, people have been saying, who's the best wrestler in the world? And every combat, every contestant in the World Cup that is all American, I might add, there is no one who is not American in the World Cup, which, uh, that's a, I will go off on a tangent if I go into that, but yeah, after and they had to drill that point home in these past few weeks. Who is the best in the world? Apparently, Shane McMahon. Like Shane McMahon feels the need to insert himself into everything. Like, let's just point this out because Baron Corbin was at ringside as well as being the raw acting raw general manager. Paige, of course, because we're in Riyadh, she was not able to go to Saudi Arabia, and so we had the commissioner, Shane McMahon, fill in for her place. But yeah, apparently he's the best wrestler in the world. Like The guy who, granted, he has been raised in this company. He's been raised in WWE his entire life. He knows some... He knows... He has some ability as a performer. He is a... He is a daredevil right at 50 he's in his 50s now he is a fucking daredevil he is not a wrestler he is a spot guy he does insane spots and no one absolutely no one can take that away from him but he feels the need to kind of say like i am better than all of you and like we still got a root for this guy it, really uh, you can really see like if they push that in a certain way, he's going to go McMahon Jr. and just start laying into people and just, he'll, yeah. You can see that tipping over at one stage, the fact that he has to feel like he can, he must prove that he's the best. But yeah, I'm not going to go into that if you're as confused as I was before. Don't, don't bother. Like, it's our, it's our job to advertise for, um, all the wrestling news and unfortunately, we just have to cover this unfortunate thing, this unfortunate fiasco that is Crown Jewel. I will say as well, going into this match, going into this event, I would say, because you had stars like John Cena and Daniel Bryan who successfully were able to 
get out of this match or get out of this whole event. And Randy Orton got interviewed by TMZ and he kind of threw shade at Cena just saying like, do you still work for the company? I was worried like when I saw that and just like, oh, they're trying to reignite the feud between Cena and Orton. But I, I, um, honestly, I think he's just be coming from the heart. Like he is just that he was really open. He's just saying like, because uh, WWE are trying to be like PR guys are saying like, we're going to try and bring the 21st century to Saudi Arabia and we're going to try and make a positive impact. And then you see this thing with Randy Orton and he just says, I'm getting paid. I am not here to say that I'm making a positive difference in this. I'm here to do a job and get paid and move on with my life, which like I respect him so much for doing that. Like the fact that he is so blunt about it and the fact that he's kind of thrown shade on, like I understand both viewpoints. I understand John Cena's viewpoint and like his, he would have had a, such a PR nightmare if he went, ended up going to Saudi Arabia but the fact that Randy Orton cannot kind of just say like, dude, it's just a paycheck. I respect him that much more. I wonder if the Saudi prince shook Randy Orton's hand. Oh, God. <laughs> but yeah, good on you, Randy Orton. Uh, and also, one of the news as well, the match between D-Generation X and the Brothers of Destruction, there was a spot there. Triple H took a nasty bump onto an announce table but they didn't take away the monitors, which, why, I don't know. But uh, it looks like Triple H has sustained a um, pectoral injury, and he is getting back to the United States as fast as possible for surgery. So that happened. Um, if you're looking for results, if you're looking for our thoughts on it, you're not going to find it here. Don't give, honestly, there is so much more wrestling out there that you can be paying attention to. I myself here in Perth, I'm going to be covering two different shows. I mentioned Reawakening earlier on in the podcast. I mentioned there's going to be an all action event. Um, this all around, guys, like watch Evolution. Evolution was awesome. I will happily talk Evolution with you guys anytime because that was a long overdue pay per view had some really great returns from some awesome women's wrestlers like you had the last woman standing match with becky lynch and charlotte right ultimately like we are here to promote uh, we promote free speech and we will happily keep talking about the things in in the wrestling world that make us smile or the things that need to be addressed but yeah we would rather talk about anything else there is more wrestling news as i'm going to prove to you guys throughout this week and all around us there are so many promotions that you can spend your money on and give your time to that deserve it that truly deserve it so please please guys see what else is out there if this fiasco has taught you guys anything it's that you should explore your options and that you shouldn't be so devoted to a prod pr to a product that does not care what you think. Uh, I think the best description I've ever heard is um, Freddie Prince Jr. He used to be a writer for WWE Raw uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, of course, Freddie Prince Jr. the actor, and um, he used to run the promo classes. Uh, he used to write a couple of things for WWE during his stay there uh he kind of described it like as much as the as the wwe universe feel like they have a say they don't as much as we all feel like we do you know in, we do in a, in a sense but these are all vince's toys it's nice that he lets you come over his house a couple of days during the week and watch him play but they're his toys he will not share his toys with you he would rather now, I'm paraphrasing here, but you're in the sandbox. He would rather, like, pin, like, he would rather bury you in sand, kneel over your body, and just, like, rub his toys in your face and say, you can't touch these. Like, that's, that's the best description I've ever heard. Like, Vince McMahon will ultimately do, like, and WWE will ultimately do what they want. 
And as much as like when we really, really push, then they have to budge on some things, but they don't listen. Devote your time and your energy to companies and promotions that do, and they will reward you 10 times over. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about WWE. We will cross over to the land of the rising sun uh, with New Japan Pro Wrestling. We have some reports there now that they uh, have been offering some really big money deals to some WWE talents. Uh, according to Dave Meltzer, there have been some offers made, been made to some WWE stars uh, in the sense that they get paid more and for fewer dates as well, which that's a no-brainer for the work that any professional wrestlers do. That's just one of the best things you can hear. Uh, Mouse even surprised Dave Meltzer, which, yeah, the guy's been around for a while, so... Uh, if we, anything comes out of it, that would be really interesting. So it's weird that they'd be willing to pay such a really big amount like they did with Chris Jericho. But um, again, uh, no specific names have been mentioned uh, at the time of this recording. But there have been rumors that names such as uh, you've got the US champion Shinsuke Nakamura. You've got Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, of course, former members of the Bullet Club. A few players like that, um, guys who have previously been associated with New Japan Pro Wrestling in the past. and. Uh, how many people think that they've been underutilized, I think is the best word to describe it. Um, yes, Nakamura is the US champion, but um, after his feud with AJ, he really hasn't done much, especially as US champion. He was meant to have a match with Ty Dillinger for the United States Championship, but he unfortunately suffered a hand injury at a house show, so the perfect 10 is now only counting to five at this time of recording. We do wish him all the very best. But yeah, and with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, if anyone is familiar with the origins of the Bullet Club, Carl Anderson was basically the spokesperson for the Bullet Club, of course, a- along with Prince Devitt, a.k.a. Finn Balor. It's unclear whether... I would be interested to see if Finn Balor would actually consider going back to New Japan, considering his history as the inaugural... Uh, Universal Champion, and again, he's one of those guys as well. Uh, and if we're talking about previous New Japan stars who have made the move to America, I'd be curious. I think a lot of them would actually really would find this offer very enticing, and it would be a great deal for them. Surprisingly, if we, especially if you went along with the story about Carl's and Anderson um, returning to see the state of the Bullet Club now, they'd be just like. What the hell has happened while we've been out while we've been over here? But that remains to be seen, and we will follow that story and keep you guys informed. And also, if you're wondering how they're able to do all this, we've also got reports as well. New Japan Pro Wrestling, their net income for 2018 has doubled since last year. We actually had the figures here. So uh, during the period of August 2017 to July 18, during that fiscal period, um, it's been noted that their Income went from about two million six hundred eight thousand to about five million dollars, so that's a really impressive figure. Now, granted, like they do have their share of liabilities, so it's not completely um, as luxurious as it sounds. But at the same time, they are in a better financial position and obviously are capable now to give a lot of big promotion of big stars a lot of more. A lot more recognition. Um, they're able to entice a lot more international talent is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, it's the biggest jump they've had since uh, February 2011, I believe, where they managed to get up to about um, 7.7 million. They kind of had a bit of a rush, rough patch these past few years, but of course, with the Bullet Club and everything else and the fact that they've actually reached such an international platform now, I I don't I feel comfortable saying on equal footing to WWE uh, because they've even got training schools over in America as well. They've got their Young Lions program there. I feel that yeah, they've really risen up to become one of the most widely renowned companies in the world at the moment. So a big congratulations to them. We will uh, keep you guys informed about any new developments with that area. But yeah, New Japan Pro Wrestling, they're really on the rise. They've actually announced as well recently that they have some of their classic matches in English for everyone to watch on their websites. I've got up here some of the legendary matches they have, stuff from the early 90s 
sometime, um, some, some in the 70s. Um, just some of the examples, they've got uh, Best of the Super Juniors, El Samurai versus Chris Jericho back in 97. Like Again, it should be worth noting, Chris Jericho, until he left WWE to venture out into New Japan, he hadn't left, he hadn't done another show in a company that wasn't WWE since the early 90s. He'd been away from it for nearly 20 years. And yeah, if you want to see what impact he made back in Japan, back in the 90s, check that one out. You've got Hulk Hogan and the Great Muda versus the Hellraisers. You've got Jushin Thunder Liger going up against Dave Finley. Yes, that Dave Finley, the man who loves to fight. If you want to see him as a spry 30-something going up against a spry Jushin Thunder Liger, check it out. You've got Black Tiger in the New Year Golden Series going up against Owen Hart. The, that Any Owen Hart match, check it out. And of course, from 1979, the second Madison Square Garden Series, you have Stan Hansen going up against Andre the Giant. Those are going to be extremely entertaining and worth your time. But in other news, uh, I will cut back to WWE. Uh, it looks like that they might be bringing back the Tough Enough concept in a new show. Uh, it's the past couple of weeks. Uh, they have been filing trademarks on some of the, all their key phrases. Uh, MLW was able to acquire the rights to War Games, so how they manage that and get that one um, under the nose of WWE is anyone's guess, but good on them. Uh, but yeah, they file for the trademark for Tough Enough for merchandise use, so it looks like eventually they want to try and revive it. For those of you who don't know, back in the dark ages of before, or while NXT was still like a reality kind of show, before that, b- before the Diva search, there was Tough Enough. And uh, there would be weekly, the weekly competitions, a group of stars would be eliminated every week, and then the winner, of course, would receive a WWE contract. We did see some great people come out of Tough Enough. Um, they're a bit few and far between, but I will mention guys like Mabel. He was good for his little run in the early 2000s. He never really, his big thing was with The Undertaker. If you're an early 2000s ruthless aggression guy like I am, you'll understand what I'm talking about with Mabel. Uh, the Miz, the Miz is the, of course, like he he was the runner up in his series, uh, but he is the best person who came out of Tough Enough, hands down. And if they come at Tough Enough with a bit of new vigor, like they. Give, mix mix in a bit of uh, NXT. They mix in a, a bit of Tough Enough from before. It could be interesting. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious. Would they bring back the Diva Search? Like, of course, they can't. They shouldn't. They shouldn't call it Diva Search again. Um, but I would be interested to see how that would play out in the modern era now, because uh, WWE have kind of got their own. Network shows like they've got Miz and Misses, they've got Total Bellas, Total Divas, and all that. Um, whether they're going to try and do it the same as before, I don't think is the right decision. I think if they update Tough Enough with the Times, then it could be a really great showing for them. But I don't know. We'll see what they do with that, if they do anything with it at all. Again, they are just trying to get all their promotions so that no one sneaks in the, like MLW did previously so if we see a tough enough revival i think nxt have taken over in terms of developmental so i wouldn't want to see tough enough going up against nxt because they will fall so hard they will fail and that will get they will have to tuck their tail between their legs for that one it's been just been announced that john hennigan is going up against jay lethal the Impact Champion will be facing the Ring of Honor Champion at a later date. This is very exciting. I think this is the first confrontation these two have had. And when a match gets announced, we will let you guys know about it. It's going to be really interesting how this plays out. I should mention as well, because I didn't name drop NXT, you've got Cassius Ono. He's actually going to receive an Evolve title opportunity where he's been announced he'll battle, battle fellow NXT Fabian. Akna 
for the Evolve title at Evolve 114 on November 9th. Of course, the next night he'll face Shane Strickland, the man uh, acting the dethroned for the Evolve Championship. Ono is booked for the other shows in December, which it should be interesting. It's an interesting relationship that uh, NXT has with Evolve. It's like Evolve is kind of being the developmental for NXT, which is also the developmental for WWE. So we're kind of playing this, we're kind of getting, getting this link, and it's an interesting relationship that's coming from this. I'm glad, I'm so glad that NXT are evolving as their own brand, and I I feel like there was a news story a couple of weeks ago where there are a few guys who actually said that they would much rather stay in NXT than move up, quote-unquote, to the WWE because they're set. Like, they, they're given great showings. Of course, like, NXT is only shown for, like, an hour or so. But in terms of, like, a lot of those guys are pretty much in a great place right now and they're in some of the, the best shapes of their career. Why the hell would they need to change that? So, yeah, it seems like a ladder's kind of being set where you've got to have Evolve, you've got Progress as well, but you've got NXT. And then after that, I don't know, like the way NXT is expanding, will they need to continue taking stars and like if they make that the, the, the dream? I don't know. But uh, again, congratulations to Cassius Ono. Well deserved for you, man. I will touch on a couple other things as well, guys. Uh, we have the AAA Lucha Libre tournament. And Taya Valkyrie announced that she would actually be a part of the of AAA Lucha Libre again, which really floored me. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Taya was the Rana Duranis champion back, I think, early last year. But what happened was they it, it's pretty much like a Montreal screw job kind of thing where they told her that they she didn't need to perform. So Sexy Star last year, she won the vacant AAA Rana de Renis Championship. Former champion Taya Valkyrie, she was stripped of that title. Like and that I'll I'll mention that it's in um Bret Hart level circumstances, but so apparently she used a chokehold during a non disqualif no disqualification match with uh Hamada previously. Again, no DQ match. That shouldn't matter. And then like so Triple A asked Johnny Muno to bring Taya's belt with him to a to a taping. Uh Johnny did it and they said they needed to hold on to the belt to take some photos, which okay. And then the very next day they announced that the Rainus the that the championship was vacant and they lied to Taya about what they were doing. And then uh at their taping, uh Vampiro told the crowd that uh Taya didn't show up as scheduled and that she wouldn't be defending the belt, but Taya was never meant to be there in the first place. So Mundo was still in possession of the other three belts at that stage. And yeah, they they basically duped her into taking away her championship. The reasons behind it, I have no idea, but then, like, with all that going on, Taya just said, you know what, screw you guys, I don't need you. And, yeah, she took everything and just went home and just let them do their business, which, again, really surprising, the fact that now she has signed up once again. There is going to be a uh, 24 Luchador, um, Lucha Capital International Tournament. Uh, we had the first parts a few days ago. We had matches like uh, Taurus versus Pagano. We had Vanilla versus La Hidra, Psycho Clown versus Murder Clown. And we had the Puma King going up against Pentagon Jr. They were... I do have some coverage from that. Um, really, really great spot. There was a really... If you can see it, um, it's all exclusives on Facebook. Um, look it up. Uh, but there was a really cute kid that went to... Um, as Pentagon was making his entrance, as a little girl... He was doing the Sarah Nero sign. It's one of the, it's one of those most adorable wrestling moments I've ever seen. And like, if you can look up just for that, like of course Pentagon won his match, which is which is a given. But yeah, get get on to stuff like that, man. So we had part one. It's going to be airing every week uh, on Monday for us in Australia. Like the next showing is uh, November fourth. You've got guys in there, like uh, 
Golden Magic, you've got um, Aerostar, you've got Fe- um, Phoenix, of course. And I will give a shout out to, uh, like I said, we are not as familiar with Lucha and all the promotions up in Mes- Mexico. But there's, we've got one guy of ours in Australia killing it right now, and that's Australian Suicide. He is one of the best high fl- aka Ryan Rollins, uh, for those of you guys in uh, MCW who might be more familiar with him. One of the biggest high flyers you will see in a while. He is crushing it over there. I believe he's a former Cruiserweight champion over there as well. But yeah, if if nothing else, check out this Facebook coverage just to see how some Australian wrestlers are really branching out and showing what we can do on the international stage. And um, uh, I had an interview last week with Craven where he's the first Australian wrestler to step foot onto the crash. And in Tijuana, that stuff like that, we're slowly creeping out there, guys. We are slowly making our making waves over in the land of wrestling, and I can feel I can feel we're gonna there's gonna be a big change coming in Australian wrestling. Like we, we say things like "You're gonna notice us," and now we conquer. But honestly, it it feels like we it feels like we are on the edge of another revolutionary moment in terms of professional wrestling and i feel like australia is going to really grab onto that and we are going to just we are going to ascend and we are going to i would love honestly i would love an nxt showing here in australia we will see it's one of those dare we dream kind of things but you never know uh i will touch on um one of the other stories I think that I think we'll wrap this up with, uh, Austin Aries, the man who was the former Impact champion, he lost his title to Johnny Mundo. Yeah, sorry, Johnny, I, I say Johnny Mundo. I try to remember what surname John Hennigan uses of all his promotions. Uh, I, so it's Johnny Impact in Impact. But yeah, he lost the title. He no-sold Morrison's corkscrew finish and he just got up he left people were wondering for the longest time is it a work like what exactly is going on and um it made johnny's victory look very weak the look took a lot of shine off that moment for johnny which is a bit disheartening but the reason we bring it up now is uh it looks like impact are still kind of good with him like, it feels like okay this was probably a work then which I'm a bit confused with. You would think that, yeah, the way they went out for it, but apparently, this, uh, according to Dave Meltzer, it's been reported that they're still kind of very high on him. The only thing that they were a little bit annoyed with is the fact that the, they had a bit of a Twitter war leading up to their match at Bound for Glory, and um, Ares, he wasn't swearing, but he just like he kind of bad-mouthed Johnny's wife, he called her husky, I think, and stuff like that. Like, just body shaming and just, yeah, just being an asshole on, online. Um, but just because the angle, like, because they didn't okay the angle beforehand, Impact was not really happy with them for that. So they were able to get a bit of TMZ coverage for it, which um, for them is good. So they changed their plans and they kind of used their like work shoot angle to an event, to their advantage. But yeah, by the looks of it, even though... Austin Aries is now a free agent. It could be we could see him head back to Impact, and of course he will bring so much heat with him just for just for leaving the way he did. Of course, Austin Aries is returning to Australia starting November twenty third in Melbourne, where he will uh, defend the World Series Wrestling Championship uh, against Robbie Eagles. Really looking forward to see that one. The first time an Australian has been able to challenge for the WSW belt. I'm really curious how Aries is going to go leading into next year. I don't know. I mean, I think they'd welcome him back with open arms, but at the same time, I don't know how the fans would react. Like he would have to, he would have to stay heel at the very least. He's kind of backed himself into a corner. So yeah, it's kind of weird to see. Uh, we will end as well on, um, we've got, according to the wrestling newsletter, uh, we'll be talking about being the elite, uh, those guys, of course, the Young Bucks, Marty Skrull, Kenny Omega, 
But according to the Wrestling Observer newsletter, the Ring of Honor roster has been shaking up because Hangman Page has declined an offer to um, re-sign with Ring of Honor. For a while now, if you've been following the B, B Elite um, episodes there, it looked like he was going to... He had been offered a deal with WWE, but he turned that down in favor of his brothers at the Elite, which, good decision, man. Good decision. But yeah, it looks like Paige turned down an offer with Ring of Honor as well, so his future's kind of still up in the air, and it's still unclear where he'll wind up. Paige is kind of wrestling still for New Japan, but it's on a very part-time basis. With the other members of the Elite, you've got Cody Rhodes. He's no longer contracted with Ring of Honor. He had alluded to doing... um. To finishing up his dates with the company recently but now like he's just said he's flat out he's a free agent he will be working with them for their final battle pay-per-view though which is that's great to see so he kind of just one more send-off before 2019 which we are still a bit unsure about and um as for the rest of the elite you got both the young bucks haven't signed any deals at all they are currently under contract until the end of the year and the other key thing as well is that this whole free agency scenario, like with Ken- Kenny Omega as well, he'll finish his New Japan deal at Jan- on at the end of January. So, again, IWGP heavyweight champion, no deal signed. What the hell are these guys going to do? They are really keeping this close to the, close to the chest. It's worth mentioning that uh, we talked about trademark before, but... Uh, one of the things that's um, slipped by us last week is the fact that um, the Young Bucks have actually managed to trademark the All In. They're able to use that the rights for the All In trademark, I should say. So it looks like if they were able to do another All In 2, or they were going to expand on All In in some fashion, whether they go to and enter the promotion, if they try and set up their own company, they uh they have the rights in play, so it's really interesting to see. Like, I'm really curious how these guys, what their mindset is going into uh, 2019. We should really, we should all be very weary of this. Like, we should all be like really paying attention to what these guys decide because it could be a game changer for wrestling all over the globe what these guys do they have proven time and time again that they do not need to be that they, they've proven that wwe is not the be all and end all which you guys should know by now as well if you listen to us because of course you have impact you have lucha you have mlw you have ring of honor uh, you've got triple a you've got like Blackcraft wrestling you've got evolve you've got progress there are so much stuff going on you will never run out of wrestling news. And of course, he, us here at the B Plus, we will continue to give you guys all the wrestling news. And whatever happens with these guys, all we know is that good things lie ahead. And sometimes when you raise one tide, you rise, all boats rise with it. So I'm really looking forward to see that. I think we will leave it at that, guys. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what we do here, please leave us a comment and please leave us a five star review. It really does make a difference, and we would love to hear from you guys. If you want to follow our fearless leader, Greg, um, you can follow him on Twitter at Greg Unchained, and of course on Instagram at the Greg Unchained. If you want to follow myself, I mentioned earlier, I am Mister Mysterious with a one instead of an I on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Pretty much all the socials. Uh, if you want to follow us on the B Plus as well, on Twitter we are at the B Plus Wrestle because wrestling wouldn't fit, and the B Plus Wrestling everywhere else. Like, share, subscribe, hit that five-star review, and from the bottom of our hearts here as well, thank you so much for listening to us. I've been Mr. Mysterious. I'll see you guys soon. Hold one! Arm drag! You're not doing this. Get out. Let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. You just made the list! Oh my god! So, no speak English. Dummy! The worst town I've ever been in. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> Coming out. Hold three. The moss covered. Three handle family credential. Mamma mia. It's me, Austin. It was me all along, Austin. Number four. Oh.
Soundball!